Hebrews chapter 13 tells us this, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. And it says, remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. The outflow of brotherly love is seen in being hospitable to others, verse 2 tells us. It's seen in being prayerful for those who are suffering. And he tells us there, the writer of Hebrews tells us to remember. And it means to recall to mind, to bring to the forefront of the mind. It is not one of those things of, oh, that name rings a bell type of things. It's not a, you know, kind of deja vu type of things. Or, or I remember long ago some, something like that. It's one of those, I can't get it out of my mind type of things. It's one of those at the forefront of my thoughts. And that's what the writer is telling us. And as we remember, therefore, we're exhorted uh, to pray. To pray for our brothers and sisters who are suffering. Why should we pray for them? Well, it may seem obvious to you, but I want to give you three uh, things we need to remember. And the first one is simply, we need to pray for them uh, because of the afflictions that they're in. Because of the afflictions uh, on them, the sufferings and pain they experience for being a Christian simply call for our sympathy and our action. And one of the greatest things that we can do as believers is to pray for them. It's one of the greatest resources. Think about this. You can affect the lives of people all over the earth without having to move from your seat. In a moment like that, you intercede in the heavenlies and God begins to work. It's kind of a spiritual 911 that we have. We enter into uh, those prayer times. Paul would write in 1 Thessalonians 5:25, "Brethren, pray for us." Hebrews 13:18, he says, "Pray for us." Colossians 4, 2 through 3 says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, meanwhile, praying for us. And prayer was an important aspect. And so we pray, number one, because of the affliction on them. Number two, we pray because of our connection to them. We are in a body of Christ here. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. Would you read it with me? And if one member suffers... All the members suffer with it. There is a connection that we have to one another, both locally and globally, as the body of Christ together. We don't physically feel the pain, but we do enter into the pain in some degree. For example, say you're out uh, working on your your uh, house or something, and you take that hammer and you go to hit that nail and you miss. There is pain in your finger, and your body reacts, right? It drops the hammer, whoosh, grabs the thumb, the eyes begin to water, the face grimaces, the mouth might say a few choice things. But the point is, is the body is involved with the pain of the one member. The problem I think that we are facing in America is that we can catch a spiritual myopia. You know what myopia is? It's when you're nearsighted. And that our, our whole focus and our whole world becomes what's in front of my face. I can't see very far away, and so because I'm not physically feeling the pain or, or personally connected in some way that, that I'm being involved and infected, that it's just out there in the distance, it's kind of fuzzy, and we need Dr. J, Jesus himself, to come in and either say, hey, let me give you some new contacts, so to speak, a, a contact of the, of the Spirit. Let me do some, some surgery in your eye to give you that focus and view that you are connected and far away you need to see around you, down the road, what I am doing, that you are connected to them. David Neff, the editorial of Christianity Today, said this, American Christians do not lead typical Christian lives. The typical Christian lives in a developing country, speaks a non-European language, and exists under the constant threat of persecution, murder, imprisonment, torture, or rape. 
And we are incredibly blessed in this country. And we don't want to take that for granted. But we don't want to lose sight of the bigger picture. So the Bible tells us to remember those in chains. Those as if you were chained with them. As if you're their cellmate. That would be a different picture, huh? We pray because of their affliction. We pray because of our connection. And thirdly, we pray because of the Bible's exhortation to us. That it shows us and tells us that we need to pray. Turn with me to Acts chapter 12 as we begin to see a great example of prayer. We're going to be jumping around various verses this morning. Starting in in verse 1, Acts chapter 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. James has been killed. Peter is in prison, facing death within the week, and the church is praying constantly for him, earnestly for him. Where did they get the model of prayer? I would propose to you from the modeler himself, Jesus Christ. Luke 22 tells us there that as he went before the cross, he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And and some of you know this very well. And there he fell down and began to pray. That was his posture of humility. And he began to pray this petition, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. His petition in prayer was simply submission to the will of the Father, but also a pleading for deliverance, God's ability, the Father's ability there. And yet, it tells us that Jesus didn't stop once. He went back and prayed two more times. There was persistency in his prayer, enduring through that. It says there in verse 44, it says this, that being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, more intently and fervently without ceasing. And it says there that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. This, I believe, was the model that the church went back to when Peter was facing death and they remembered Jesus and what took place in the garden. They they took his posture of humility, you might say. They took his prayer of simplicity and, and sincerity of surrender to the Father's will and God, you can deliver. And so we commit it into your hands. They took his pleading for deliverance. They took his petition. They took... His persistence, earnestly, constantly, intently, with fervency. Gang, this is a great model of praying under pressure. A great model of how to pray when you're pressed manually. And some of you this morning may be pressed in some regards, whether it's relationships or jobs or health or whatever it is. And, and there is a persistency and there is, there is a pleading in your heart that needs to come before the Father with such earnest expectation. He's invited you to boldly come in and you approach and you say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. I'm bowed low. I'm pleading with you that you are able. And the church in Acts 12, that's what they did. They didn't just throw up a prayer and say, hey, good night, have a good night. They exercised in it and through it. They knew the stakes at hand and they knew the hand of their God that he could deliver. And they remembered Peter in prison and prayed. Look at what D.L. Moody said. We'll put this on the screen if we can. He said, pray as though everything depended upon God, but work as though everything depended upon you. It's a good attitude to have. 
Look at John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace. He penned this. He said, You are coming to a king. Large petitions with you bring. For his grace and power as such, none can ever ask too much. And God heard the prayers of this church. And he moved in a very miraculous way. Verse 6 tells us, And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. I would propose to you this, that the prayers of the saints aided in the rest of this prisoner. Peace in his heart. He's sleeping. He's about to die the next day. I imagine it would be a sleepless night. But no, the prayers have enabled him, aided him along the way to be at peace and rest. It's in the Father's hands. Peter had been in and out of prison at least two times before this. I mean, by this time, he's got a punch card. And, you know, 10th night is probably free. But the point is, is, is that this is not an unusual thing to him. And they prayed. But their prayers not only helped Peter rest, I believe they helped Peter's release. Look at verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel, uh, the, now, uh, now behold, an angel of the Lord, I'm sorry, then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And, and he said to them, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel, did not know that what was done by the angel was real and thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. From their prayers, the angel was sent and Peter was delivered. God looks to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are turned towards him. What does God accomplish through the prayers of believers, the saints that gather together? I know even in my own life that at times I've gotten discouraged from praying because I'm not seeing the answers right away. But what if God could pull back the veil for a moment and we could see the spiritual battle that's taking place in the heavenlies as we pray? What if he pulled back the veil for a moment and we could see the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much? What would we see? How many groups and believers have gathered together and began to pray for their persecuted brothers and sisters and at that very moment, God began to release the chains. God began to encourage the hearts put them at rest. God began to work in their persecutors. Heaven is going to be an incredible testimony to see the connections that God was making as he moved in one place and he worked in another. Verse 11. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And so Peter heads off to the prayer group first. The church is tightly knit. Love is abounding here and prayer is of importance. And verse 13 tells us, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she didn't open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so, so they said, it's his angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Note that though they prayed as they should have, they didn't expect it to happen so suddenly. He said, kid, you're seeing things. It's his angel. It really shows, a, in a sense, a lack of faith in the God that they were praying to. This situation might be unique, might be a little unusual, but it wasn't unheard of. If you flip back a few pages to Acts chapter 5, 
we see that this wasn't the first time the Lord had done this with these disciples. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. And the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles, Peter included, he's one of those, and put them in the common prison. And check out what happened here. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. So God had done this previously before, and why wouldn't he be able to do it here in Acts chapter 12? God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And God delivered Peter. The church is encouraged. And God continues to move. So we've seen kind of why we need to pray. Because of their afflictions on them. Because of our connection to them. Because of the Bible's exhor exhortation to us. We see this model of earnest prayer and Jesus in the garden and we see the church at this point praying for Peter's deliverance. But what about the question how? How can I pray for them? What can I pray for them? And I want to uh, give to you about, about seven things that you can have up there and uh, just kind of, kind of to look at and kind of go through some of these things. Some of these make just common sense, but others of them you might add to your prayer list. The first is for deliverance and protection. Of course, we saw it in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, but listen to what the Bible says. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 2. Finally, brethren, Paul says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for not all have faith, unreasonable and wicked men. Philippians 1.19, Paul writes from prison and says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Philemon 1.22 says, For I trust that through your prayers, Paul says, I shall be granted to you, that is delivered from prison. And of course, there are so many stories of how God can deliver We've seen even this past September as uh, the, the things happening in Egypt with 71 Christian churches were attacked and looted and burned to the ground. 54 in less than a 24-hour period. Hundreds dead, 4,000 injured. An incredible wave of persecution in that country. The next month, a, a member of the parliament in uh, Afghanistan uh, calls for the converts from Islam to Christianity to be executed in order to stop the rapid growth of Christianity in their land. And so we pray. We want to pray for deliverance. Uh, secondly, we pray for the open doors of the gospel. Paul, writing from prison in Colossians 4, he says this. And he says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I also am in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. What's Paul asking prayer for? Pray that a door would be open. Not for my deliverance. Of course, that would be beneficial. But more importantly, for the message of the gospel to take root. I remember a couple years ago reading about uh, Pastor Zhang Rolayong. Is, is his name, Zhang Rongliang, is the Chinese, is the Chinese version. And, and here is a pastor from the underground church, and, and he was released from prison after seven and a half years. Uh, he had spent a quarter of his life in prison uh, at this point, and he was released, and, and, and he turns towards, he turns towards the, the uh, 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 Christian representative there, and and he begins to share with them the doors that God had opened for the gospel. 5,000 people in this prison, and most of them had heard the gospel. And he said this, quote, I am happy that you and others tried to arrange my release, but in one way, I am happy you failed. If you would have been successful, there would be no church in that prison today. Wow. The doors that God opens for the furtherance of the gospel even through the suffering of saints. The third thing you might pray is for the boldness to speak. 
The boldness for them to speak that when the door opens, they can step through. Acts 4.29. Peter and John have been persecuted. They come back to the believers and they begin to pray. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Give us boldness, Lord. Paul from prison writes in Ephesians 6, 18 through 20, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Pray for boldness. Pray that when God opens the door, I'll have the boldness to share the gospel clearly and it would penetrate the hearts. Number four, you would pray for those persecuting them, that God would reach their heart, that they may be saved. Look at what Jesus said, Matthew chapter five. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We think about Paul and Silas. Remember they were in prison, Acts chapter 16? They're bound up in stocks. They've been beaten down. The guard himself has done this to them. And they're singing and praying at midnight, the midnight concert. And all the prisoners are hearing them and the guard is hearing these things coming out of their mouth and all of a sudden the earthquake happens and it rocks their world, literally. The chains fall off, the doors swing open and the prisoners stay put. And the guard begins to say what? What must I do to be saved? How God can use those persecutions to reach the persecutors. Pastor P from northern Nigeria, his son was brutally murdered by a Muslim group. He said this, for me, the issue has been settled. The Lord called me to reach out to my people and I have to. So whether they are killing me, I will still love them with the love of God. I do not see them as my enemies because they killed my son. I have forgiven them because they do not have Christ and that is all they can think at their level. Pray for them, that those persecuting them may be saved. And number five, pray that they would have that ability to endure and keep their focus on, on the glory that is to come. Listen to what he, Romans 8 tells us. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We need that focus. They need that focus. 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. This is Paul saying, listen, I'm, I'm about to throw in the towel. He understands those thoughts of going, it's all over. I'm done for. I mean, the great apostle Paul went through that? Yeah. But look at what he says. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Hebrews 10, 34 and 35. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. What a focus. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. It is heaven in your view? And pray that heaven would stay in their view as they endure such persecution. Number six, pray for their personal health, the physical pains and the comfort from the Spirit in their losses. We read this in 2 Corinthians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. He is able to comfort. Persecution hurts. These people, I'm sure, are not going, ha, no big deal. Give me another one. No, there's physical pain, emotional pain, mental pain pain. There's much suffering and only God can bring the peace and the rest. Seventh, pray for their families that God would meet the needs and heal the hurting hearts. Many families have a loved one that it either died or is in jail or and it really becomes the, the responsibility back on the church to become an outsource to help meet those needs and care for them and encourage them uh, when they are suffering. 
That's why we had you write letters to a Pastor Saeed's wife uh, to encourage her and her family uh, as her husband is over there in the prison. But here's the reality. The reality is that Satan will continually and always seek to destroy God's witnesses and debunk God's word. But there's one thing that he has to remember. He's in a losing battle. Jesus Christ has already won. And our hope and our life is in heaven itself. Even as we sang this morning, listen to Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him by what? The blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Tertullian, a second century believer, said this and has really been ringing in my head. He said, kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust. The more you mow us down, the more we grow. For the seed of the church is the blood of the Christians. We've already won the battle because Jesus has won. 